For decades, Russia has been the world's second most powerful military. Today, it is the second most powerful military inside Ukraine. How in the world did a nation with such a significant military overmatch get into a quagmire against a much weaker power? Just what is wrong with the Russian military? The numbers speak for themselves. As of 30 days since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has lost a staggering 1,794 vehicles. Of these, 877 have been completely destroyed, 34 seriously damaged, 228 abandoned, and 655 captured by the Ukrainians. Compare that with 536 vehicles that Ukraine has lost, of which 205 were destroyed, 16 severely damaged, 37 abandoned, and 278 captured. And these are just the figures confirmed via international intelligence agencies and amateur sleuths using social media and satellite photographs. The real casualties are bound to be much higher. When it comes to personnel, the only official figure given by Russia's Ministry of Defense is a few hundred KIA. However, the real figure is estimated at between 10 to 15,000 dead, with many or more wounded, missing in action or deserting. U.S. intelligence estimates that Russia is suffering an incomprehensible 1,000 casualties a day. Simply put, this makes victory in Ukraine impossible for Russia. So, what in the world is going on with an army every Western analyst had touted as the second best in the world and a near-peer competitor to the United States? The problems are numerous, but like all great tragedies, start out with the smallest things. Maintenance is something nobody likes doing. It's a downright pain for all involved. But preventative maintenance is vital for keeping the complex machinery of war working, and the United States military places a premium on it. There are rules, regulations, and all sorts of detailed checklists for every Everything, from maintaining proper tire pressure in a vehicle to oil changes and probably even how to adjust your seat properly. But in Ukraine, Russia has shown with startling clarity what happens when you ignore even the most basic of maintenance. One of the most common images of the war is abandoned Russian vehicles littering the Ukrainian countryside by the hundreds. And while there's numerous reasons for this that we'll get into shortly, by far the dumbest is a simple failure by the Russians to turn their vehicles around once a month while in storage. Logistics and maintenance experts from Western armies were quick to spot the telltale signs of sun damage on many tires found flat on abandoned Russian vehicles, which let them know exactly how those tires got flat. As the sun beats down on a vehicle kept parked in storage, it weakens the rubber, which is why it's important to routinely rotate a parked vehicle so that the sun doesn't have a chance to break down the rubber on the sun-facing tires. Russians didn't do this, and inevitably, their multi-million dollar vehicles ended up as scrap for Ukrainian farmers when they were forced to run them at low pressure through mud and their tires popped. There's ample evidence of a failure to conduct even basic maintenance across hundreds of captured Russian vehicles, but tires once more betraying the Russian military for one reason. They're cheap. Russian vehicles appear to be equipped with Chinese military tires, specifically the Yellow Sea YS-20 tires, which, according to a former quality auditor of U.S. Army tactical vehicles, Trent Talenko, is a bad copy of the Michelin XZL military tire. The Chinese tires aren't rated to carry as heavy loads as the vehicles they've been placed on, and they're riddled with construction defects. While Western military Military tires are more expensive, they're also much higher quality and even undergo x-ray testing to ensure integrity. Chinese tires are not held to the same standards, and Russia has bought them by the thousands, ironically making things like $40 million air defense systems completely useless thanks to a few cheap tires. That's far from the only cheap equipment being fielded by Russian military, though, as it's become abundantly clear that the world's second most powerful army is a paper tiger, sometimes so literally it's frightening. Recently, Ukraine's National Agency on Corruption Prevention sent a thank you letter to the Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shuiku, praising his efforts in ensuring high levels of corruption in the Russian military. Ukraine's discoveries have been nothing short of shocking. For example, tank explosive reactive armor is supposed to defend the vulnerable vehicles from anti-tank weapons fire, something that has been abundantly mauling Russia's armed forces. Yet, upon capturing several Russian tanks, the Ukrainians cut open the armor panels and discovered that instead of an armor package, the tanks were protected by egg cartons. But Russian soldiers haven't fared much better. On February 2nd, Russia unveiled its futuristic new Sotnik full-body armor, allegedly capable of stopping a 50 caliber round. It's impressive. But in the real world, Russia's actual soldiers are protected once more by cardboard. Ukrainian forces have found time and time again that the plates inside a Russian body armor are nothing more than stiff cardboard. The Ukrainian NACP thanked the Russian defense minister for ensuring that Russian troops would be so easy to defeat, and advised that they include training for their soldiers on how to properly surrender to Ukrainian forces. So why are Russian soldiers going to war wearing cardboard body armor and in tanks protected by egg crates? When Vladimir Putin inherited the Russian military, it could barely keep its own 
ships afloat, and soldiers were wrapping their feet in cloth instead of wearing socks. For two decades, though, Putin has channeled hundreds of billions into modernizing the Russian military, prompting the New York Times on January 27, 2022 to write the following headline, Russia's military, once creaky, is modern and lethal. But they weren't the only ones to seriously misjudge the state of Russia's armed forces. In 2020, The Economist ran the headline, Russian military forces dazzle after a decade of reform, followed by the subheadline, NATO will need to step up. Over and over again, Western media and defense publications have been awash with tales of a resurgent Russia investing hundreds of billions into creating a modern lethal force. But the truth has been laid bare. Much of that money has obviously been siphoned off by individuals across the length and breadth of the Russian leadership and acquisition chains. Corruption is nothing new in Russia. Putin himself is likely the world's richest man thanks to all the wealth he's stolen from national industries and oligarchs he disliked. What is new is just how jaw-droppingly pervasive Russian corruption has been, stretching so far and gobbling up so much funding that Russian soldiers are using egg crate tank armor and cardboard armor inserts. Cheap Chinese tires show a further siphoning of funds, with untold millions pocketed by spending well under allotted procurement budgets. It's all but a certainty, then, that Russia's infamous maintenance problems aren't just a sign of bad leadership and poor standards, but also a result of the corruption that has eaten up funds meant for maintenance of equipment and procurement of quality replacement parts. We have evidence of this from the many reports of Russian armored vehicle crews scrounging through Ukrainian junkyards for replacement parts, which in at least one verified instance led to Ukrainians stealing other parts from a broken down vehicle while its operators were themselves trying to steal parts from the Ukrainians. When they returned, they installed the stolen part and then realized they were missing other parts, and thus set off once more to raid the junkyard. Ukrainian citizens took that opportunity to steal back the original part in question and disappear with it. The vehicle was eventually abandoned, and Ukraine might have officially caused the first combat casualty of warfare through trolling. Ineptitude is yet another of the staggering number of problems affecting the Russian military. We have seen this at the highest lengths, with the Russian intelligence services completely failing to properly assess how Ukrainians would respond to an invasion, or how well prepared the military was to defend its homeland. Russia expected an easy victory, so easy in fact that on day one Russia launched multiple air assaults just outside of Kyiv, expecting that it could simply create an air bridge by seizing runways and fly reinforcements in, with the capital falling within three days. Instead, the air assaults were almost all destroyed, inflicting horrible casualties on Russia's much vaunted airborne forces. In Russia, its airborne forces are legendary and even enjoy an entire day dedicated to them, called Paratroopers Day. However, when put to the test, Russian paratroopers failed to achieve even one of their objectives in the opening days of the war, being thoroughly defeated by Ukraine's rapid response forces. It would be unfair to place all the blame on Russia's paratroopers, though. Truthfully, they were let down by the massive incompetence of Russian leadership, who believed lightly armed paratroopers could hold airports long enough for heavy vehicles to simply be flown in. This underestimated not just Ukrainian capabilities to respond to deep penetration air assaults, but also Ukrainian air defenses, which were still mostly active even weeks into the war and made reinforcing via air bridge impossible. The failure to shut down Ukraine's air defenses is another casualty of Russian incompetence, though this time it stretches all the way to the top. When the United States led a coalition in 1991 to end Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, it shut down Iraq's air defenses within 48 hours through surgical and overwhelming strikes, while fighter aircraft swept from the skies any Iraqi fighters foolish enough to resist. By comparison, Putin dedicated only a small portion of the vastly superior in number Russian Air Force to try to shoot down Ukraine's air defense. What should have taken Russia a few days to accomplish has yet to materialize, and incredibly, a month into the fighting, Ukrainian air force is still largely intact and flying up to five sorties a day. It's believed that Putin did not want to dedicate the number of aircraft necessary to the task, as it would signal that his special military operation was, in fact, what it really is, a full-scale war. To maintain domestic support, Putin must keep up the facade that Russian forces are still engaged in only light fighting, and thanks to his massive control over Russian media, he's still somewhat successful succeeding at maintaining his narrative. But this has allowed Ukraine's air defenses to continue to take a heavy toll on the Russian aircraft. With 39 planes and 40 helicopters lost in just the first two weeks alone, the total number today after a month of fighting is unknown, but believed to be well over 100. Incompetence in the Russian military, however, extends all the way down the chain of command. Russian forces have to date shown little competency in everything from convoy security to responding to ambushes. In this video, we can see Russian armor bunched up inside of a neighborhood, and subsequently they fall prey to a well-coordinated ambush. Not only do the bunched-up vehicles make easy targets, but the destruction or damaging of one vehicle can cause traffic jams as the panicked drivers try to get away. This is a failure of the proper way to use armor in combination with infantry. In the West, armor is always closely supported by infantry, whose job it is to protect the tank from enemy anti-tank teams. Not only 
should these vehicles not have been bunched up so closely together? They're lucky they weren't also under air or artillery attack. If the convoy had to stop for some reason, they should have been deploying infantry to screen the flanks against exactly this type of ambush. Yet time and again, we see Russian troops failing to grasp even this most basic of combined arms concepts, and Russian armored vehicles are paying a staggering price for it, with nearly 2,000 combat losses. In yet another video, we see how Russian troops have been reacting to ambushes. In this video, we can see a column of Russian vehicles wander into a Ukrainian ambush, with a vehicle taken out by an anti-tank team. The US military teaches that the best way to survive an ambush is to assault it by turning armored vehicles into the ambush so their thicker frontal plates are presented to the enemy, and deploying infantry to fire on and suppress the enemy. Forces outside of the kill zone can then launch an assault against the ambush's flanks. Instead, the Russian forces scatter in panic, with only two of the tanks turning to the ambush and returning fire. Forces outside of the ambush simply come to a dead stop, and no Russian infantry dismounts to assault the ambush and relieve pressure on their buddies in the kill zone. Tactical incompetence extends to pretty much every aspect of the Russian convoy security, though, as their convoys have been observed coming to full stops at intersections, an absolute no-no for any convoy. Then, when they eventually begin moving again, instead of deploying screening elements on either side of the intersection, the convoy simply pulls ahead in single file, leaving themselves wide open to enemy attack. Perhaps the most baffling of all, though, is the destruction of air defense equipment via airstrike within parked convoys, with the operators not bothering to turn on their air defense radars for hours while the convoy sat at a dead standstill. Russian troops are proving themselves to be poorly trained to the point of gross incompetence, but we couldn't mention convoys without explaining one of Russia's greatest failures to date. By now, everyone has seen images of an incredible 40-kilometer convoy of armored vehicles, fuel trucks, and artillery all stuck on its way to Kyiv, with similar scenes repeating themselves at a smaller scale throughout Ukraine. Just what in the world is going on with Russia's convoys? Incredibly, the answer is simple. They're out of gas. Even more incredibly, they still haven't solved the problem after three weeks. Initially, Russia's forces went into Ukraine with approximately three to five days of supplies and relied on their logistics fleets to keep them resupplied past that. The only problem is that Russia doesn't have enough trucks or logistics personnel to properly resupply its armed forces. Instead, the troops rely on railroads to haul supplies to the front, a task helped by Russia's very impressive rail logistics corps capable of building new railway, maintaining rails, and repairing them. The problem is Ukraine keeps blowing up those railways, and Russian troops can't seem to stop them. At this point, any hope of supplying forces inside of Ukraine via the shared railways between the two nations are a pipe dream. But you still need to get supplies from a railhead to where the combat is actually taking place, and Russia's lack of supply trucks makes this impossible in a meaningful way once an offensive has moved a few dozen miles out of friendly territory. Each Russian combined army is assigned a material technical support brigade, consisting of two truck battalions with a total of 150 general cargo trucks with 50 trailers and 260 specialized trucks per brigade. This gives Russia enough logistical capacity to resupply forces no further than 90 miles from a supply dump, as increasing distance distance lowers the number of trips each truck can make and adds further delay to full resupply. With forces now inside Ukraine's borders and far outside the range of supply depots safe behind enemy lines, resupply has become slow, but adding to Russia's problems is the fact that the Ukrainian forces are very good at finding Russian trucks and destroying them. In fact, Ukrainians have shown a preference for destroying trucks over armored vehicles and have a saying, tanks can't fight without resupply. With each lost truck, resupply takes even longer, leading to stalled-out offensives and an incredible 40-kilometer-long train of parked vehicles. But the general ineptitude of Russian leadership makes orderly resupply difficult, causing massive traffic snarls of their own creation and further miring Russian troops down. This lack of leadership highlights yet another of Russia's massive deficiencies, the complete lack of trained and disciplined non-commissioned officer corps. In the US military, non-commissioned officers, or NCOs, make up the backbone of its armed forces. These are the men and women responsible for the everyday running and maintenance of the American military, and Russia lacks any similar capability. Thanks to its hierarchical nature, the Russian military has placed little emphasis on properly training a professional NCO corps, and now that it's facing its first modern foe, the military is suffering for it. While America places an emphasis on empowering its NCOs to make on-the-fly decisions and seize the initiative, the Russian military has no such leadership cadre, which inevitably leads to a need for senior officers to lead from the 
front, but senior officers are few in number and simply can't be as omnipresent as a wide cadre of NCOs can be, and even more importantly are far too valuable to risk dying on the front lines, which is exactly what's been happening to Russia's majors, colonels, and even generals. As of this writing, seven senior Russian generals are believed to have been killed in one month. By comparison, the United States lost two generals in 20 years of fighting the global war on terror. One was killed in the September 11th attack at the Pentagon, and the other was killed on August 5, 2014 during an insider attack in Afghanistan. Zero of America's general officers have been killed on the front lines. Russian generals claim to simply lead from the front and take inspiration from Prince Peter Ivanovich Bagration, who was fatally wounded at the Battle of Borodino in 1812, or, or Generalissimo Alexander Sugarov, who always fought on the most exposed part of the front. However, the truth is that the Russian generals are having to fight at the front because they don't trust their subordinates to follow orders and because of the complete breakdown of their communication abilities. Communications, though, is yet another another of Russia's mind-boggling failures in its execution of this invasion. Once more, likely due to corruption, the world has learned that a significant amount of Russia's armed forces are operating on civilian quality unsecured radios. Radio broadcasts between Russian units have been recorded by civilian observers using basic equipment, with some civilians taking the opportunities to simply jam Russian frequencies or troll them with the Ukrainian national anthem, the popular American Yankee Doodle song, or other random audio. Incredibly, even Russia's strategic bombers have have been recorded operating on completely open and unsecured radios. Not only has Ukrainian interruption of these unsecured communications caused massive problems for Russia's military, it's even led to strategic defeats of its forces. At least one Russian general has been killed after his position was pinpointed by listening in on these unsecured broadcasts. Ukrainian artillery has also been very successful in using these broadcasts to pinpoint Russian units and saturate them with fire. Perhaps most baffling of all, though, is the failure of Russia's highly secure cryptophone system. Introduced in 2021, ERA was touted as the most secure communication system in the world, capable of secure conversations from almost anywhere on the face of the planet. However, Russian generals and intelligence agents have been unable to use it inside of Ukraine. The reason? It relies on cell towers and uses 3G and 4G to communicate and the Russians have destroyed most of the cell towers in the areas they've occupied. Hundreds of millions of dollars in research, development, and procurement costs all wasted on a system that can't work when the Russians need it the most simply because somebody didn't tell the troops not to destroy the cell towers. Now, Russians are forced to use unencrypted landlines for highly sensitive conversations, which inevitably have been intercepted by Ukraine and Western intelligence agencies to great strategic effect. By now, you are no doubt fully aware of the extent of Russia's war crimes against Ukraine civilians, and this this is yet because of another failure of the Russian military. Russia has a very low supply of smart weapons, both because it simply can't afford them due to 2014 sanctions and because Russia's always placed a low priority on precision weapons. Most of its aircraft also lack targeting pods. Inevitably, it was feared that as Russia's stockpile of smart munitions dried up, it would resort to much more indiscriminate dumb bombs, resulting in high amounts of collateral damage and very little actual destruction of intended targets, Ukrainian military positions. This turned out to be the case within a week of the invasion. But the scale of assault on civilians has only increased exponentially since then. Why? Simply put, because the Russian military is really bad at war. They're so bad that they rely on mass slaughter of civilians to force a peace on their terms. They did this in Georgia, they did it in Chechnya, and they did it in Aleppo, killing thousands of civilians with indiscriminate bombing and artillery fire. Now they're doing it in Ukraine as their offensive bogs down due to a stiff Ukrainian resistance. Putin's strategy is simple. Kill so many civilians that Zelensky is forced to accept a peace on Putin's terms, even though Putin is the one losing. This is the reason why Russia bombed a maternity hospital, killing pregnant women and their unborn children. It's the reason why they bombed a feeder, clearly marked with the word children on both the front and back yards. And it's the reason why their troops have been recorded opening fire on civilian vehicles and civilians standing in bread lines in videos too graphic for us to share with you here. They have even routinely attacked convoys of civilians fleeing conflict areas through humanitarian corridors that they established themselves, only to close them hours later and open fire on anyone stuck within them. Russia's strategy is to cause a humanitarian crisis so terrible, Zelensky will have to admit defeat even though, and we cannot stress this enough, Russia is losing this war. But Ukrainians aren't giving up, and Putin's terror campaign is backfiring, galvanizing an estimated 15,000 foreign volunteers to come to Ukraine's defense in just one month. Many of these are amateurs with little more than a willingness to help defend Ukraine, but many more of these are highly trained professionals from militaries all across the West who bring years of experience fighting in the Middle East to bear on incompetence 
incompetent Russian forces. As this invasion progresses, we'll learn more about the true vulnerabilities and deficiencies of the Russian war machine. But as of right now, it's clear Russia is no longer the second most powerful military in the world. In fact, they're only the second most powerful military inside Ukraine. Now, go check out What If Russia Invades Ukraine, or click this other video instead.